Thank you very much. And it's a very great pleasure to be back in Seoul. It's the first city in the world to have had two basic income Earth Network conferences. So that's a special uh, feature in itself. And what I'm going to be talking about this afternoon is, I believe, very close to the spirit of Korea. As all you Koreans know, but many of us do not know, Korea was founded in BC 3333, which, if I'm not mistaken, is a long time ago. And it was founded on the principle of Hongik Ingan. I now I apologize if I, if I have the pronunciation wrong, but the ethos of Hongik Ingan is community and individuality, coming from some of the things that Philippe was speaking about earlier this morning, about fraternity and freedom. And the sense of Hongik Ingan goes all the way through. As, as you know, Seoul has been called the sharing city. And it's embodied in another concept, which Hayang Hak the sense of village communities. Now we know that the Japanese in their occupied period here did a lot to destroy that ethos of solidarity and community and the commons, but they failed. And that I think is why there is a resonance in Korea for basic income because I think it is grounded in our sense of the commons. And my work over the last 20 years, if not more, has been trying to blend a perspective based on the commons, in the sense that I've always believed that we will only win and have a basic income as meaningful part of a new income distribution system, if basic income is part of a new progressive politics of the 21st century that escapes from the politics of the 20th century, which was between social democrats and Christian democrats or neoliberals and so on. The commons provides a different perspective on reviving society. Now, the work that I've been doing, I'm very privileged that the plunder of the commons has been translated. It looks beautiful in Korean. I only hope the translation reads as well as it does in English. And I have a new book out, which has just come out, uh, called The Blue Commons. And as many of you know, in 1982, we had the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, under which the Republic of Korea gained 557,000 square kilometers of sea. So your sea area is 4.7 times your land area surface wise. That means, just as in many other countries, that what happens in the sea is a vitally important part of understanding the future of the political economy and politics. And it gets remarkably little attention. I've recently been involved in a number of controversies because under the United Nations Convention, what is outside the economic zones is part of the common heritage of humanity. It belongs to all of us equally under the law, and it has to be shared. And at the moment, 
multinational capital is trying to plunder it, aided by China, and we have a real threat that we, the commoners, will be losing a vital part of the world economy going forward. I won't go into the details of that, I will run out of time. But we are in a very important, pivotal point in the global transformation. Karl Polanyi's idea of the great transformation, we have been living through a disembedded phase of first neoliberal capitalism and then what I call rentier capitalism, where more and more of the income has been flowing to the owners of private property, financial property, physical property, and most of all, so-called intellectual property. And less and less has been going to those who perform labor and work. And in the process, there has been a plunder of the commons, the natural commons, the social commons, the civil commons, the cultural commons, the knowledge commons. And they've been turned into sources of huge rental income. That is illegitimate. That is unjust. That has no moral principle justifying what's been happening. And we should be very angry. And that should anger should be part of our progressive politics and is linked to the proposals that I've been trying to develop. Now, in the process of this rentier capitalism, what has happened is that a new class structure has taken place with the precariat, which has also been translated into Korean, and we're living in an age of chronic economic uncertainty. Now, as every economist knows, uncertainty is a very specific form of insecurity. It's when we have unknown unknowns, when we are fragile because we cannot work out the probability of being hit by a shock or a hazard or something that could have devastating consequences. Whether it's pandemics, whether it's economic crises, whether it's natural disasters, they keep coming at us. And this uncertainty is, cannot be dealt with by the welfare state institutions and policies of the 20th century, of Beveridge and Bismarck and the welfare systems that were based on contingency risks that you could work out the probability of being hit and work out the probability so that you could have compensation. With uncertainty, people are chronically insecure and they have no sense of being able to have an anchor in their lives. Obviously, for those of us supporting basic income, that is a huge development because we need ex ante protection not ex post compensation to give us robustness and resilience. So that is the context. And at the same time, the old social democratic fiscal policy of progressive income tax and consumption tax doesn't work in a globalized economy where rents are being earned, where people can park their incomes in tax havens and so on. So we need a fiscal reform, a fiscal reform, which I call an eco-fiscal strategy. And it comes back to the commons. What are the commons? The commons are what belong to all of us. They're not open access because they require a governance structure with stewards or trustees preserving the commons and with gatekeeper organizations holding those stewards to account. It goes back, in my particular culture, to the Justinian Codex of AD 529, which established four types of property, private property, state property, nobody's property, commons. 
and the sea and the land and the seabed and all natural resources and social institutions bequeathed to us as commons are separate and identifiable. A commons is inappropriable by private interests or state interests. But we've seen the plunder diminishing the commons in many respects. In the books, I've tried to enunciate seven governance principles of a commons. Don't have time to go through them, they're discussed in the book. They include the public trust doctrine. The stewards have a duty to preserve the commons as an equal value. The intergenerational equity principle, which means that the stewards, the sovereign, has responsibility for preserving the commons for generations and generations in the future. Very important for the sort of pr proposal I'm about to make. It includes the social memory principle that if it's uncontested as a commons for a certain period, then you preserve it as a commons. A precautionary principle, right to subsistence and right to habitat and deliberative democracy principles. I won't go into them, but they are there. Now, what would be an eco-fiscal strategy if one wanted to preserve the commons, revive the commons, and if one wanted to deal with the problems of rentier capitalism and uncertainty? I believe, and it goes with what Nam was speaking about earlier, that we need to produce a system of common capital funds. The common capital funds should be built on the principles that those who are taking from the commons, who are making profits from our commons, should compensate the commoners. And those who are polluting the commons, diminishing our commons, should be compensating those who are suffering as a consequence. In that sense, I believe deserving is an issue. Because you need to say that if somebody pollutes, and as a result you die earlier, you should be compensated, figuratively speaking. And I think that this principle is something that most people can easily understand. It's important to think, if we establish a commons fund, how would we raise the income for that fund? What I've proposed is a situation of several levies. I prefer the sense of levy, so you leave tax in the term for income tax, consumption tax, capital tax, and so on, for your public services or whatever you're, you want to use for government expenditure. A levy system would include the one that we had discussed earlier so brilliantly, which is a carbon levy. We need a carbon levy. We will not tackle global warming unless we have seriously high levies on the use of carbon. Let's be serious. Only Sweden has really established a serious carbon levy, but any country can do it. We also need a land value levy. The land was a commons. Now it is taken and used and exploited. So those who have benefited should be compensating the rest of the commoners. Among the others, there are smaller ones. But let me just mention just a few. I've got about 20. They're all similar character. You have a minerals levy. The minerals are taken, turned into profit, and are taken from our common resources. That's pretty clear. So they should be paying what Tom Paine would have called a ground rent. 
on taking from the commons. The same with taking from the sea. You have fish quota systems, you have fishing access agreements where the beneficiaries are taking the fish from around Korea, for example. The Chinese are plundering your fish populations, but are only paying a fraction of the cost. We should have a levy on what they're doing. But there are many others, like a frequent flyer levy. Many people, including some of us in this room, are guilty of flying very frequently. Our flying produces pollution, which is devastatingly bad for the health of people not doing it. Think of the ports, our ports, which are mainly now owned by financial capital, incidentally. The ports, the big ships, when they go in, they keep their diesel engines going all the time, polluting the water and the air, resulting in the premature deaths by cancer of thousands and thousands of people around the port communities. They should have a heavy levy put on, which would discourage them doing it, but until they stop doing it, they would be raising the funds. A number of the other levies I don't have time to discuss, but they are discussed in the books. And those levies should be paid into what is a commons fund. We often hear of the Alaska fund, which has been a sad disaster. A far better example is the Norwegian capital fund. And the Norwegian fund acts like a commons, but it only has one source of revenue, and that's oil and gas in the North Sea. But what the fund has done is adhere to commons principles. And the commons principles start with the intergenerational equity principle. You can only recycle the revenue you get from, say, a carbon levy, if you preserve the capital value of the resource. With carbon, you can recycle practically all of it. But if you're talking about a diminishing resource like oil or gas or minerals, or what they're talking about, about the deep sea mining at the moment, you're talking about a diminishing resource. And there you have to apply the intergenerational principle, because you must not treat the revenue as a windfall gain to be sent to everybody today, because that would be unjust on future generations of commoners. You can only recycle the revenue from diminishing exhaustible resources from the investments made by the capital fund. Now, I've estimated that the various forms, not just carbon, not just energy, but the various types of eco-fiscal levies would very quickly produce a very big capital fund. Now, the Norwegians calculate that the net return on the investment by their fund, net of management costs, is 4% per year. That means that there is 4% of their revenue that can be recycled, potentially as dividends, common dividends. But the great thing about a commons fund is that many of the sources of revenue for the fund are not held down by the intergenerational equity principle because they are renewable resources. And those renewable resources can be recycled almost in entirety. I've argued in the various, various types of uh, levies that in some cases they are replenishable resources so that they require some expenditure to reproduce. For example, a forestry levy where people are taking from our forests making profit, you have to use part of the revenue to replenish the forests. 
but that still leaves about 80% of the levy from that source that can be recycled as dividends. And the interesting thing is that it has a number of positive effects automatically built into the Commons Capital Fund and Common Dividends. First of all, of course, it is an ecological approach. It is a really strategic way of confronting the biggest single crisis of our time because it is penalizing those who are doing the polluting, who are doing the global warming, who are destroying nature. And in every respect, they're paying a price that will discourage them. But while they are being discouraged, they will be paying into the fund. The great thing is that the fund itself can be built up as a stabilization device, a macroeconomic stabilization device, which we need in the, in the face of all these international crises, and as a way of dealing with public debt and dealing with the distributional crisis of our time that we are now all about. The inequalities are fundamentally due to capital taking rents from our commons. And if we took those rents back and recycled them through this fund, then you would reduce one of the major, if not the major source of inequality growth in our era. It's a matter of common justice. The commoners should be compensate. But it's also, if you're religious, it's also a matter of religious justice. Pope Francis, in the middle of the COVID pandemic, wrote a very public letter. And it's got a beautiful sentence. Whether believers or not, we are agreed today that the earth is essentially a shared inheritance whose fruits are meant to benefit everyone. Today, those fruits do not benefit the many. They benefit a very tiny number of obscene plutocrats and an elite. I found that when one talks about the commons, and talks about the meaning of the commons as a way of life, a way of commoning, a way of shared existence, a way of relating differently to nature than is imagined under capitalism otherwise. People get it. You don't have to be a avid left-wing person or right-wing or whatever. People soon get the idea. The commons is what belongs to us, and commoning is what we want to do. I don't want to be permanently in, in a job, a job, a job, but I want to work. I want to common. I want to live in a convivial environment. And thinking along the lines of commoning, which is where my new book is about to come out, The Politics of Time, means a different way of living. And common dividends and this commons capital fund would be important parts of the fiscal route to enabling us to live a better type of life, working and commoning and indulging in real leisure. That's a vision for all of us, I think. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Standing. Please give another big hand.